Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, as usual, I'll ask if there are any questions about the course in general or anything like that before I start. Okay, so I'm just going to keep talking about Barclay. Um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, so there are basically three things I want to talk about today. Um, one is about uh, mathematics and natural science. Barclay explains his views about that in this reading. And another, which, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a subtopic of, of this, especially about mathematics, but it's interesting in its own right, and we'll see that Hume has something to say about it also. So, um, uh, the infinite divisibility of space. And the last thing is the refutation of skepticism. And I hope I also will get to this and of atheism. Okay. Um, so about the first one first. Um, so the general thing I want to say about uh, mathematics and natural science, according to Berkeley, is that um, that the way it's supposed to work is this. Um, you know, here's, here's my mind, that, and it contains ideas, of course. So, um, but you know, some of these ideas are ideas of sense that come from God, and some of them are ideas of the imagination that come from me. So, um, basically, the way mathematics and natural science in general are supposed to work, I think, is that, um, so there's certain regularities that hold, wait, I think some, anyway, there's certain regularities that hold in the ones that come from God. Maybe I should draw them separately, even though they're all in my mind, but, you yeah, know, maybe that would be a better way to this is my mind, and in it, there's an order of ideas that comes from God. So um, what I'm doing when I do science or mathematics um, is that I'm observing the rules that God observes, that, that God follows in exciting these ideas of sense. Right, so in other words, I'm, I'm observing the rules, uh, the, the syntactical or grammatical rules of God's language. Um, and those depend on the divine will. Right, so the reason there's that regularity is because God wanted it to be there. And what I'm trying to do is set up my own set of signs. So the order of these signs dep depends on my will. I'm trying to set up my own set of signs that will 
um, allow me to predict what's coming next in the order of divine signs. So basically, I'm trying to get my the rules of syntax of this language to correspond with the rules of syntax of God's language in such a way that I can, you know, leave off the um, the series of ideas of sense, go through a bunch of my own ideas, and um, I'll come back with the expectation of the very idea that I'm going to get next from sense. So I'm trying to conform my will to God's will. That's what mathematics and natural science are about, right? Like that is trying to set up our language so that it will, um, um, we'll get results that mirror the results that follow in God's language. Um, so, you know, for example, like, uh, I see someone put two apples in a bag. So, or, I mean, we'll leave out the other person because that's confusing. I see two apples fall into a bag, right? So... So that's a matter of these ideas of sense. Um, then I imagine, I mean, and this might involve writing them down signs, but let's suppose it doesn't, because that, again, makes things more complicated. I imagine certain signs of my own. I imagine, like, um, a mark for one of the apples and another mark for the other apples. So I have a rule by which I take those two apples, those two ap and remember, two apples are ideas in my mind. And I, so to speak, write down in my mind, instead of the two apples, these two marks. And then I see another apple fall in, and I write down another mark. And then I have a rule that allows me to, to take the two marks and the one mark, and write them like that as three marks. And then I have another rule that allows me to substitute the ideas of three apples for these three marks. So at this point, I'm imagining three apples. And then I look in the bag, and sure enough, I see three apples. Right? So this little procedure that I've done with my symbols in my mind ended up when I, so to speak, cashed it out at the end, having the same result as um, God's procedure with his symbols. Um, so, I mean... This way of thinking about what natural science is doing is, first of all, obviously um, radically empiricist. Why? Because um, Of course, we have no way of knowing what regularities God wills except by observing them. So, um, so we can't predict anything about what we're going to see in advance, in advance of experiencing regularities. And then the best we can do is to look for regularities in what we've seen and find a way of predicting that they'll continue, basically. But um, uh, there's never any guarantee of that, right? Because again, the only, we, the only way we know that 
God wills that when you see two apples fall into a bag and then you see another, if you look into the bag, there'll be three apples. Is that what's happened so far? But uh, there's nothing that binds God to do that in the future. Right? We don't know that the will, divine will, is to always do that. Maybe the divine will is to do that up until now, but from now on, when you, you know, you'll see four apples or one apple or right, who knows? So, um, so it's radically empiricist, and this is an example of um, the relationship between two ways of thinking: empiricism and voluntarism. Um, this is a connection. Uh, I mean, I guess when you think about it, it's kind of obvious, but, but I didn't really think of it myself. I, you know, I first had my attention drawn to this by Charles Taylor. Um, I, I think in his book, Sources of the Self, which is an interesting book. Um, so in any case, uh, um, right, so empiricism is the view that all our knowledge is based on experience, and um, voluntarism is the view that uh, well, there's different ways of looking at it, but it's something like that the divine will is prior to the divine understanding, or in other words, that um, there are no rules that God is following when he wills. Rather, the divine will is the source of all rules. So you can see how these two things go together. Right? There's nothing... Um, um, it's because there's nothing we can know in advance about what God is going to do that we have to rely on experience. So now, I mean, as Taylor also points out, uh, it doesn't take long, and this is what we're going to see in Hume, basically, for empiricists to realize that, uh, you know, this part isn't really necessary. <laughs> right? You can just say, we don't know what's going to happen, and you still get empiricism. But um, but in any case, these, these two things do go together historically and conceptually, and that's why um, um, there's often, as in Barclay, a connection between, uh, like, uh, um, how do I put it? But it's kind of like an extreme religious point of view. Everything depends directly on God, and there's no... Uh, there's no authority uh, in any rules that God has to follow or something like that. And that going together with this extreme empiricist point of view, which at, I guess at first you might expect that those would be at cross purposes, but actually they, they go together really well. Okay, so... Um, Right, so um, as far as the empiricism, now I'm going to just um, read some of the things that Barclay actually says about this. Um, some of these are from the reading from last time, and some of them are from the new reading. But, um, so this is... Section 31 of part one on page 34. 
all this we know, and you know, this is talking about what we know about the regularities in ideas that allow us to regulate our, our conduct. Um, I guess, you know, maybe I should have made that point here. So, I mean, in other words, what's the point of trying to anticipate the divine will? Why are we doing that? Obviously, it's because, you know, we want to know what to do. Now, I mean, what to do? So, I mean, I said I was going to try to avoid this complication, but obviously, like, Maybe it's not obvious, but according to Barclay, what happens when I move my hand? Well, I kind of imagine my move, my hand moving. There's more to it than just imagining it, but somehow um, I, you know, I deliberately have that image of my hand moving plus something, and then I see my hand move. Now, um, did the imagining that I do make my hand move? Well, you know, when I say I see my hand move, I'm talking about ideas of sense, right? So they're caused by God. They're not caused by me. Nothing's caused by my ideas. So imagining the hand moving isn't going to cause the, me to see the hand moving and whatever else there was to that like the act of my will or whatever also can't make me see the hand move right because only God causes ideas of sense so basically you know um, that's why you know learning what to imagine is basically the same as learning what to do Right, like after this, you know, I might imagine, um, you know, I need four apples for my recipe, so I might imagine going and picking another apple, and that's going to be the thing I need to do in order to actually go pick another apple. And that is, in other words, to in order in order for God to cause those ideas of sense that involved me walking over and picking the apple and all that stuff. So, um, so you know, in the end, I'm tr I want to really anticipate a sequence like that, which involves me doing stuff. Um, I'm not sure if that made sense or not. Other questions about that? I mean, that is, I think it makes sense, but I'm not sure if I explained it in a way that makes sense. Are there questions about that? All right, well, let me go back and read this passage that I was going to read then. All this we know, not by discovering any necessary connection between our ideas, but only by the observation of the settled laws of nature, without which we should all be in uncertainty and confusion. We should be all in uncertainty and confusion, and a grown man no more know how to manage himself in the affairs of life than an infant just born. So, um, right, that thing about we, there's, we don't perceive a necessary connection between our ideas, again, is the radically empiricist part of it. If in this sequence here, I could see a necessary connection between, somehow, between the ideas of these two apples and this one apple, and the idea of, of these three apples on the other end, then um, at that point, I wouldn't just be uh, like guessing what God's going to do next based on what he did before, right? Because I would, there would be a visible necessity. And that would mean that um, in something outside of me, either in God or in, I mean, it basically will end up being, uh, at least if you believe what Locke does about the primary qualities, will be in something that is neither me nor God, rather it's, it's bodies. It's, it's, 
the bodies that are the apples according to Locke. But in any case, w whatever it is, outside of me, there's going to be some rule that things have to follow. They must follow it because I see that these ideas are necessarily connected. And if they're necessarily connected, then the things that cause them must be necessarily connected. Right, so that's ultimately a way of saying that not everything depends on the divine will. Um, now, I mean, I'm not sure what Locke would say if you said this to him. He might say, oh, well, you know, but by a miracle, God, I mean, uh, well, but I mean, at least remember that Locke doesn't think we can believe in a miracle like that. Right? Like if I hear a voice in my head saying, you know, from now on two plus one equals five, and there will always be five apples when you put two and one together, um, I can't believe that it's God, according to Locke. And I think by the same token, if I was to every, from now on, every time I looked in the bag, there were always five apples instead of three. I couldn't believe that it was because two plus one is now five. I would have to think it's because of some, you know, it's because apples are growing inside the bag or something, right? That is, so uh, like, whether or not God could theoretically change his mind about that, according to Locke, we, that's not something we could experience. We see the necessity, and so we can't believe that something violates it. There's a question here. Isn't anticipating God's order an act of volition? Is it then an idea of sense as well? Wait, do you mean according to Locke or according to Barclay? Yeah, so according to Barclay, operations of the mind are not ideas or like ideas. According to Locke, there are ideas of volition. Um, I mean, there's an operation of volition, which is not an idea. It's an operation of the mind, but there's an idea that, of reflection that it causes in our mind when we perceive it. But according to Barclay, there are no ideas of operations of a spirit. Um, So we express our, you know, you might say, uh, then we'll wait. How, um, if we have no idea, um, like, how can we say that we're anticipating God's order or something like that? And the answer, as usual, is that those words don't, don't stand for ideas. They express our will. And, you know, um, the words express our will, but a more direct expression of the will is the, this, the, um, the ideas of ourselves doing things that we will in virtue of what we anticipate. Right? So, like, I, you know... I expect there to be three apples in the bag, and therefore I want to do X, Y, and Z. And um, um, so there are ideas in my mind that express that will, that act of will. Does that... Okay, I don't know. I hope that helps the question. Um... So, um, but, right, but the idea, I'm going to put it this way, the ideas in my mind that express that act of will are not ideas of an act of will. They're ideas of, for example, me going over and picking another apple. 
that is, there are ideas that are just like the ideas of sense that I'll get when I actually walk over and pick another apple, except that they're fainter and etc. Um, okay, so um, Right, so that means that um, um, the sense in which we can explain things by the laws of nature um, is only what's called covering law theory of explanation. Now, this is not Berkeley's terminology. Here, again, I'm introducing some 20th century terminology. The covering law th theory of explanation says that um, explanation, explaining a fact, just consists in showing that that fact is an instance of a universal um, rule that we think is true. Um, right, so although Barclay doesn't use that terminology, he says that, this is section 62 on page 47, um, There are certain general laws that run through the whole chain of natural effects. These are learned by the observation and study of nature and are by men applied as well to the framing artificial things for use and ornament of life as to the explaining the various phenomena, which explication consists only in showing the conformity any particular phenomenon has to the general laws of nature or, which is the same thing, in discovering the uniformity there is in the production of natural effects. Right? So, like, in other words, when I say the ex... I notice the apple falling out of the tree, and I say, well, that's explained... Could I... Oh, someone's asking, could you repeat the definition of covering law? Um, it, I mean, actually, Barclay just repeated it for me. I'll show that to you again. Right? Um, which explication consists only in showing the conformity any particular phenomenon has to the general laws, laws of nature, right? The explanation of a fact just consists in finding a general law that this fact is an instance of. So like if the apple falls out of the tree and I say, you know, explain that. So the explanation might be all heavy things fall, right? Meaning um, this particular heavy thing fell and this one fell and this one fell and this one fell and this one fell, right? And this apple fell too. And that's the explanation of why it fell. Right, so that that explanation, it right, it it finds a law that covers this case. That's why it's called a covering law, but um, but it doesn't explain it in the sense of showing it was necessary. Right, if you know, um, if apples only fell on Tuesdays and the rest of the days they floated up into the sky and an apple fell out of the tree on on a Tuesday and you asked like oh explain that I'll say well the explanation is that apple fall out of trees on Tuesdays and that's just that would be just as good an explanation <laughs> if right if that if that regularity held, it would explain the apple falling out of the tree. Whatever regularity there is that this is an instance of explains it. And that's all explanation uh, um, of natural events comes to. 
right? As opposed to a rationalist theory of explanation, which says that in order to explain something, I have to see a, some kind of logical connection between the cause and the effect. Um, you know, if you've taken 100B, hopefully you saw this emphasized or whatever in Descartes and Spinoza and Leibniz. I think maybe it's clearest in Spinoza. You know, one of Spinoza's axioms is that um, the, yeah, he puts it, but the concept of the effect involves the concept of the cause or something like that. Right? That is what it means to be a cause and effect is that you can't think about the effect without no, without seeing that it depends on the cause. Um, so Barclay and Locke, you know, without bringing in that, well, I mean, actually, so this is what Locke puts Locke kind of in between here because Locke says explicitly there's no logical necessity, right? There would be no contradiction in a triangle where the angles didn't add up to two right angles. That's why it's not a trifling proposition. It's not contained in the definition of those terms somehow. So it's not logically necessary, but there's some other kind of necessity that's visible Right, that's what Locke is 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 substituting for the rationalist connection of the cause and the effect. Um, and Barclay, I think, for the reasons I was um, giving last time, right, because he just he thinks it's absurd that something could make something else necessary if it's not if neither of them is active or has power to bring about the other. So. Um, unless, of course, it would be a contradiction to have one without the other. So it should have added that. But if it's not a contradiction, and it's never a contradiction to write two different ideas, the existence of one can't contradict the existence of the other. So, um, uh, therefore, and neither of them is the cause of the other because they're inert, and therefore there can't be any relationship of necessity between the ideas, and therefore the ideas can't explain each other in the strong sense of showing one showing why the other is necessary. All you can have is a certain pattern of ideas explaining a particular instance by just saying, uh, oh, it's not surprising, it's just like all the others. It explains it in that sense. But if you say, couldn't it have happened differently? The answer is, yeah, it could have, you know, this, who knows why there's this pattern. So, um, now, I mean, um, this is Barclay's theory of explanation in natural science or mathematics. That is, explanation of ideas by other ideas. And, right, that is ultimately explanation of ideas of sense by other ideas of sense. So, you know, we have an explanation for why there are three apples in the bag because that's a pattern and it's the pattern that we've learned to anticipate by setting up our own little language here um but that's the only explanation it's not we don't see a bond of necessity between these between these events and this event of th seeing three apples in the bag whereas Locke presumably would say we do Right? That is because number, figure, motion, etc., are all primary qualities. And we do see certain necessary relations. And uh, again, that's, I think, that Locke would say that since we see those relations to be necessary between our ideas, um, we literally like, can't believe that that law is violated. We would be going against our own reason. It wouldn't 
there would, there's no contra. Well, I don't know. Maybe in the case of arithmetic, Locke thinks there actually is a contradiction that that kind of complicates matters. But anyway, I mean, let's say there's no contradiction in there being five apples in the bag. But um, um, but there, but it does. But I do contradict myself if I believe it, because my reason shows me that it's necessary that there are three. And that's, so that's Locke, and that's what Barclay is saying is, not only don't we have it, but it's impossible and absurd. Of course, um, Barclay does think that something explains the pattern, and each instance of it, in the stronger, like, rationalist sense. Something makes it necessary, right? But what makes it necessary, of course, is the divine will. So, um, so that doesn't, I mean, we can't do this with the divine will, right? We can anticipate the order of ideas using our own order of ideas, but we can't set up an order of ideas that describes God's will because God is a spirit and ideas are not like spirits. And ideas are not like spirits precisely because there's no necessary connection between them. Um, so uh, they can't resemble any structure in the spirit that caused them. There can't be an, an analogy between some relationship between these ideas and something about God because the relationship between the ideas is... Um, because there is no it relationship between the ideas except in God. I don't know, that last remark may have maybe made it harder to understand rather than easier, but... Um, so, I mean, so in other words, um, realizing that this is where the real explanation is doesn't help us set up an alternative alternative mathematics and science which would supply these strong rationalist explanations by explaining what God must do. Right? I mean, so like uh, according to here, maybe the easiest person to draw into contrast would be Leibniz, right? According to Leibniz, we do have this principle, the principle of sufficient reason. And the principle of sufficient reason, uh, among other things, implies that this is the best of all possible worlds. So, um, so we do, we know this principle. Of course, we don't have the, well, at least we don't have clearly and distinctly the information we need to apply it, but um, to apply it accurately. But, as you know, we can do the best we can using the exact same principle that God is using. Right? So we can try to figure out what will happen based on the idea that uh, the best thing will happen. Um, and, you know, that might sound kind of... Like it wouldn't work very well, but the the main Leibniz's main application of that principle would be in ethics. But yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't get too far into trying to explain Leibniz. Anyway, the point is, according to Berkeley, there there is no such principle, right? He couldn't say in words what principle God is following because that would be setting up ideas to resemble the will of a spirit, and you can't. So. Um, um, so it's not useful in that way, but it is useful to correct the, um, like, uh, pretensions of natural science and mathematics, because, uh, it makes sense to say, according to Berkeley, uh, Mathematics and natural science can explain things, sure, but only in this way. They can't give a real explanation. 
a real explanation, but show the necessity, right? So this is what he says, for example, this is in section 103 on page uh, 63. So he's talking about the, the explanation of the motion of bodies by the principle of universal gravitation which first of all he says isn't really universal. So, I mean, he's just kind of, he's, it's clear when he discusses Newtonian physics that he does, you know, he's not really an expert on it. <laughs> Some of the things he says don't make sense. But anyway, the point is, so the question is like, can we explain things using this principle of attraction between bodies? And he says, um, so he gives several instances of the ex of the principle of attractions supposedly explaining things and then he says but in this as in the other instances i do not perceive that anything is signified besides the effect itself for as to the manner of the action whereby it is produced or the cause which produces it these are not so much as aimed at now right so uh, um if if um, explaining the manner by which an effect is produced or the causes of it were just a matter of this, right? Like explaining the manner, the cause of something is just showing how it is an instance of irregularity that we've observed, then saying that, um, you know, the apple falls because of attraction meaning the apple falls because bodies tend to move towards each other. So he doesn't really understand the difference between motion and acceleration, which is uh, obviously a big problem in trying to explain Newtonian mechanics. But in any case, let's say it's the explanation is just that bodies tend to move towards each other. So, um, so Barclay is saying, well, that doesn't say why they tend to move towards each other. Well, I mean, in this sense, it does say why they tend to move towards each other, right? That is, it says they, that they tend to move towards each other because they tend to move towards each other, meaning that in every particular case where they move towards each other, it's because, so to speak, um, that's what we observe to happen, including in this case. So when Barclay says in the passage I just read that, you know, as to the manner of the action whereby it is produced or the cause which produces it, these are not so much that aimed as aimed at. That's because he um, doesn't think this is the only thing you could possibly mean by explaining something. On the contrary, he believes in this stronger way of explaining something, but he says that um, the answer to that is always going to be, um, you know, that's what God wanted to happen. So, um, So all our natural scientific explanations, which try to explain ideas in terms of other ideas, um, never get at the cause of anything in that strong or strict sense of cause. They never uh, explain anything in that strong or strict sense of explanation, right? So. Um, Here's, this is section 106 on page 65. There is nothing necessary. He's again is talking about this is still part of his discussion of gravitation. There is nothing necessary or essential in the case, but it depends entirely on the will of the governing spirit who causes certain bodies to cleave together or tend towards each other according to various laws, whilst he keeps others at a fixed distance, and to some he gives a quite contrary tendency to fly asunder, just as he sees convenient. Right? So that's the real explanation. 
But the real explanation is not something we can, you know, understand in the sense of translating into our symbols and manipulating them in order to reproduce it or something like that, because the real explanation is the will of a spirit. And the only way we can represent the will of the spirit is by trying to make our will conform to it. Okay, so um, okay, so are there questions about that so far? I basically finished saying what Berkeley thinks natural science and mathematics are doing and what they're not doing. So the question is, um, what are they good for then, if that's what they're doing? And um, the answer, according to Barclay, is, well, um, if you think what they're good for is to know everything, um, to know universal principles that always must hold everywhere, then you're going to be disappointed. Because... That's not what they do, right? They just look at regularities we've observed and, and you know, classify events according to those regularities, basically. Um, so, uh, um, it doesn't allow us to perceive a necessity in anything that's going to happen next. So what does it allow us to do? Well, so, I mean, basically, there's, I think there's two things that Berkeley thinks that, that mathematics and natural science are good for. So one is, I mean, so these rules of divine syntax by which the ideas of sense follow each other um, are arbitrary rules. Um, Right? They, de they depend on the will of God, and we can't give a further rule that God is following, that, his, you know, that determines his will. So they're arbitrary wills, rules. And so um, we can't, and again, this is the difference with Leibniz, we can't say, it doesn't even make sense to say, basically, these are good rules. These are the best rules. But, it does make sense to say um, that the fact that there are some rules and we're not always unpleasantly surprised when we rely on them shows that there is goodness and wisdom and constancy in the cause. So, um, so the rules we perceive are evidence of divine goodness and wisdom. Um, but they're not evidence of divine goodness and wisdom because they're good rules. And that's why, again, just seeing the rule doesn't give us a reason to think that God is going to keep following that rule. Because we see the rule, we don't see anything good about the rule. What's good about it is that there is a rule. <laughs> so if it turns out that, the, you know, that um, uh, that rule was good for a while, but not anymore, or, you know, not in every case or whatever, then as long as there's some rule, <laughs> that's still evidence of the goodness of God. But, um, and therefore, we don't really have evidence that this rule will continue. So that, again, is why I said, you know, we don't see, we don't learn any logical reason, so to speak, or any rational reason for believing that something else is going to happen next. Um, 
Um, and this is why, you know, Barclay thinks that um, uh, people who want to use natural science and mathematics to form ever bolder, more general hypotheses about how everything works are missing the point. Um, um, you know, the point is to observe the rules that you've already seen and like, in the particular, the ones that were useful and be grateful that we can rely on them. That is that so far we've been able to rely on them. Um, that's number one. And number two, the other thing we can do is to rely practically on the continuation of those rules. So what's going on there is we don't have a logical reason to expect God to keep, go, keep up the same rule, but we, we do um, have faith that whatever God does next will be, um, that we have faith that God is reliable, generally speaking, right? That God is not a deceiver. So, um, um, and therefore, even though we have no, logical reason to to expect that this will happen next we have so to speak a moral reason to act as if it will that is to depend on the reliability of god so therefore the two proper uses of natural science and mathematics according to locke are number sorry according to barclay are number one to contemplate the divine goodness in so far as it's shown itself so far, or I said so far twice, but anyway, the divine goodness that has shown itself so far, and number two, to use it in our, in our, for our practical purposes. So, um, so the attempt to extend um, scientific or mathematical knowledge to broad new hypotheses when we don't see any use in them is just trifling with syntax, according to Barclay. And so this is the way he explains it. This is section 109 on page 66. As in, as in reading other books, a wise man will choose to fix his thoughts on the sense and apply it to use, rather than to lay them out in grammatical remarks on the language. So in perusing the volume of nature, it seems beneath the dignity of the mind, the mind to affect an exactness in reducing each particular phenomenon to general rules or showing how it follows from them. We should propose to ourselves nobler views, such as to recreate and exalt the mind with a prospect of the beauty, order, extent, and variety of natural things. Hence, by proper inferences, to enlarge our notions of the grandeur, wisdom, and beneficence of the creator. So that's the first use I just mentioned. Right? The regularities we've seen so far, we, we step back and contemplate them and say, oh, this is evidence of the goodness and wisdom of the creator. And lastly, to make the several parts of the creation so far as in us lies subservient to the ends they were designed for, God's, God's glory and the sustentation and comfort of ourselves and fellow creatures. Right? So that's the second use I was mentioning, the practical application. If you um, take an interest in it beyond that, it's like... Uh, reading a book about some important subject and only thinking about the grammatical rules and trying to extend them to, to broader and broader grammatical rules that will explain why every sentence has to be exactly the way it is. And Barclay says you're missing the point of the book if you do that. The point of the book is to understand the will of the author and to apply it for, the, for your purposes. You know, I mean, would Locke agree 
I mean, again, you know, this gets to their disagreement about what language is for, right? That's what Barclay thinks that not only of books, but of all use of language, that the appropriate, the main use of it is to express someone's will and to affect other people's will. And so the main way of like consuming it is to allow it to affect your will appropriately. Um, so um, that's what you should be doing when you read a book. Right? Locke would say when you read a book, you should be trying to get the ideas that were in the ideas of the, of the, that were in the mind of the author. Um, Right, and I, I, I think so. That's definitely what Locke, what Barclay thinks about natural laws, like the law of universal gravitation. I've been claiming that it's what he thinks about um, geometry and arithmetic as well. Um, um, so it's a little hard to be sure what he thinks in the case of arithmetic. I mean, you know, he explains the origin of arithmetic basically in this way that we, you know, first people learn to substitute counters or marks for things so that they could, um, if they wanted to know how many things there were, they could manipulate the marks or counters and then they would know how many things there were. Um, and then they learned better ways of doing that, where you don't have to have one mark or count per thing, but you can, you know, use one mark to stand for a lot of things and so on and so forth. And that's how we got our number system. And that's what arithmetic is about. I guess the question is, you know, at the very beginning, when we decided that, like, if we want to know how many apples they are on the barrel and it's hard to count the apples. We can um, substitute little counters for the apples instead. And as long as we make sure there's one counter per apple, and we know that the number of these will be the same as the number of these, does Barclay see some kind of necessity there? Or does he think it might just well have not worked? It's due to divine goodness that it worked. That you get the same answer when you count up the counters as you do when you count up the apples. I mean, I say when you when I say when you count up. Now you could put it this way: that like if every time, so let's say when you put the apples in the barrel to begin with, every time you put in an apple, you put a counter down here, and now later on, every time someone buys an apple, you take the apple out and give it to them, and you also take a counter out. So. Like, um, could it just as well happen that you would run out of apples before you run out of counters? That's a way of putting it that doesn't involve counting, which, I mean, for counting means you need counters or numbers, right? But in other words, can you rely on the counters to run out or, or do something else at the same time the apples do? Um, but I think Barclay actually um, agrees in advance with Kant that uh, um, there's no contradiction in that not working. And therefore, Barclay, unlike Kant, concludes that it just depends arbitrarily on the divine will. Um, but whether that's the case with arithmetic or not, in the case of geometry, I think it's pretty clear that he doesn't see, I think it's pretty clear that he doesn't see necessity in geometrical theorems. And um, I think like 
probably the best way to see that is to get into what he says about the divisibility of space. So I'm going to, that was the second thing I wanted to talk about. And I'm going to go and talk about that now, unless there are questions about what I said so far. Okay, so the infinite divisibility of space. So, I mean, Maybe I should write, you know, and or of extension. Um, I mean, I'm adding that because uh, I think I got to talking about this point in Locke. Ray, the, that Locke thinks the idea of space is simple, and therefore that, and he thinks that an empty space is not divisible into parts. Um, a space that's full of body is divisible. Um, so, uh, um, empty spaces can be said to have parts because we know the parts of bodies can move into them, basically. Um, that distinction is going to become important again in Hume when he talks about this. Uh, I think Barclay would agree based on what he says about pure space here. Uh, but um, So if you like, say, this isn't about infinite divisibility of empty space, which in a sense doesn't have parts. It's about the infinite divisibility of body. So like, for example, the infinite divisibility of a line. Um, right, think of the line as a very long, perhaps according to infinite divisibility, infinitely thin, or anyway, very thin body that fills up space. And the question is, um, is it divided into smallest parts or is it infinitely divisible? And we know Locke says it's infinitely divisible, right? There can't be a smallest part of extension. So, um, um, Barclay says, number one, that's evidently false and absurd. And number two, it's only because people have believed that, that they got into all kinds of weird, uncouth results in mathematics that make it hard, in geometry in particular, that make it hard to understand. So, I mean, I think the type of result he's thinking about is this, that suppose this is a square. Right, so we call the side of a square S and the length of diagonal D. So, um, of course we know that 2s squared equals d squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. But at the same time, Pythagoras, according to the story, discovered that. He also discovered another thing which is very disturbing, or was very disturbing to Pythagoras anyway, which is that um, there are no two natural numbers, n and m, such that this is true. Right, so a natural number means like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the positive integers. Um, I mean, it wouldn't help to allow negative ones, but that's because that even mean it, right? So the positive integers, there's no 
positive integers n and m such that 2 times the square of n equals the square of m. And I'm, I've actually tried to prove this on the board in the past. It's not actually not that hard to prove, but, uh, but I'm not going to go into it because I think we'll get bossed up. So just uh, uh, take my word for it, but there's a pretty simple proof of that. So what does that mean about this picture? Well, it means that, you know, suppose the side S is made out of N parts. So there's no number, no number M of those same size parts that you could make the side D out of. In other words, the sides are incommensurable, as we say, right? Like whatever unit you use to, to measure the side exactly, you can never use that same unit to measure the diagonal exactly. Or another way to say this is that the square root of 2 is irrational. That is, there is no ratio, no rational number. whose square is two, right? So like, this is never true, and therefore this is never true. Um, so I think this is the kind of weird result Barclay is talking about, the fact that there's some lines that you can't, compare to each other using any ruler, right? No matter how fine you make the divisions on the ruler that you're using to measure this, they'll always be, it, uh, it will never fit this exactly. Now, I guess, as Barclay would say, to those of us who've become accustomed since we were young to learn this fact, uh, it doesn't seem that surprising. In fact, this is one of Aristotle's examples of how um, uh, philosophy or science begins in wonder, but it doesn't end in wonder. So he says, you know, nothing would surprise the geometrician more than if the lines turned out to be commensurable, even though at the beginning that's very surprising when you first learn that fact. But Barclay says, you know, that's just an example of how people can be got to believe any weird thing if you just tell them enough times they get used to it and then they don't notice that it doesn't make sense anymore. And of course he uses that opportunity to get in a dig at transubstantiation, right? So he says just like, you know, you can slowly uh, bring a convert to Catholicism to the belief in transubstantiation, which we all know is absurd according to Barclay. Um, but, you know, people can get used to anything. So, um, okay, so Barclay's promise is that he can get us out of this and we won't have to be used to believing this weird thing anymore and other things like it. Um, Now, um, and so, I mean, Barclay's proof of this, that what should I say first? Right, so I guess, okay, so put it this way. Barclay says, um, we only seem to get results like this because we believe that space is infinitely divisible. Um, but in fact, uh, mathematicians never explicitly stated that principle that space is infinitely divisible. Yeah, okay, all right, no, I'm not starting to like this.
Okay, yeah, okay, so let me put it this way. So Barclay says, so I haven't yet said why Bar Barclay thinks that it's absurd that, that extension would be infinitely divisible. But before we hear his reasons for it, there seems to be a big reason against it, which is that mathematical proofs work so well, right? That they, that, that they seem to generate certainty, that they seem to be, every step seems to be clear and convincing. Um, so, you know, against that, along comes Barclay and says, hey, I have this great proof that space isn't infinitely divisible. Um, and there's a famous, uh, um, thing that a recent uh, um, philosopher, David Lewis, uh, passed away in 2001, I guess, um, but uh, he's a very important American philosopher, and um, he, you know, in talking about what the relationship of philosophy should be to mathematics and science, he says something like, um, you know, I think we know the results of mathematics and science much better than we know the truth of any philosophical theory. You know, like if I were to come along to the mathematicians and the scientists and say, hey, uh, I've got this theory that shows that you're wrong, they're going to say, Oh yeah, like those other theories you had about how like material things don't exist. So he's thinking of Berkeley when he says that, and etc. He lists a whole bunch of other philosophical theories that um, uh, no one believes, <laughs> right? So like, uh, what is, what what is Berkeley's response in this particular instance going to be to that? Right, we you know we say Barclay, look, we know the results of mathematics. Yeah, your argument seems kind of convincing, but you know, I mean, it's not as convincing as mathematical proofs. Those are really convincing. So Barclay's response to that is that actually the mathematical proofs are fine as far as they go. They've just been um, like the mathematicians have deduced correctly from their premises. And there was nothing wrong with their premises either. There was just certain unstated premises that they have in common with everyone else, and that's why they didn't examine them. And those, you know, slip, you know, slipped into the proof and had um, the result that you know made it draw this absurd conclusion. So he's saying, yeah, mathematical proofs are fine and convincing as long as you correct the mistaken pre-mathematical assumptions that make them give absurd conclusions. And the mistaken pre-mathematical conclusions are, well, I mean, so in, you know, at fundamentally, he says, they're the, just the familiar belief in abstract ideas and things outside the mind. But he says in this particular case, what the belief in um, abstract ideas and things outside the mind allows, uh, um, causes the mathemat mathematicians to think is reasonable is this infinite divisibility. Right, so in section 123 on page 72, one thing I noticed when I listened to myself lecturing last year, which I never noticed, is how often I say right. Right? I don't know if that's a bad thing or not. Anyway, here it is. Um, so section 122 on page... Uh, Sorry, section 123 on page 72. The infinite divisibility of finite extension, though it is not expressly laid down either as an axiom or theorem in the elements of that science, yet is throughout the, is throughout the same everywhere supposed. <laughs> okay. 
um, and thought to have, okay, so uh, let me not go on with that. It's just this part is what I'm interested in. It's nowhere laid down as an axiom or as a theorem, but it's throughout the same everywhere proposed, supposed. Well, I mean, okay, maybe it's not an axiom. At least it's not one of Euclid's axioms. Um, the truth is that in uh, modern axiomatizations of geometry, there is an axiom that says this, basically. The axiom of the continuum. Uh, well, okay, no, that gets you more than just infinite divisibility. I guess there isn't really an axiom that says this in particular. Right, so, um, so okay, maybe it's not an axiom, but it's a theorem. For, ex for example, when I proved that no matter how small the pieces I divide this line into, I can't get a whole number of those same size pieces to add up to the length of this line. That shows that lines are infinitely divisible. Because if there weren't infinitely divisible, there would be some smallest piece. And, um, and then if you added up those, if you, if you took that smallest piece as the unit, you would have to be able to use it to add up to whatever line you wanted to. Isn't, I make me making a couple extra assumptions in there. Um, I think Barclay also makes them to think about whether that, what if the smallest pieces are, what if the indivisible pieces are all different sizes? I mean, I don't think Barclay thinks that makes sense because he thinks an indivisible thing is as small as it can be. It doesn't have parts. We'll see Hume saying that explicitly. Um, so all indivisible things are the same size by definition, according to Hume, and I, I think according to Barclay too, right? So in other words, you can't say, oh, I'll get a bunch of the ones that I use, the indivisible things that I use to make this line, and then I'll get almost to the end, and then I'll get like a bigger indivisible thing to fill in the gap or something. They're all the same size. So if they're all the same size, you can see that obviously it's not going to work, right? Because um, there would have to be an N and an M that would make this true, and there isn't. So it seems like it is a theorem. So I think Barclay's answer to that is... Um, and this is how the this is how the belief in abstract ideas and um, material substances comes into this. So Barclay says, you know, um, a line is an idea in our mind. A line is an idea in our mind, and. It's a particular idea, right? There's no general idea of line. There are just particular ideas of lines, or I guess what we would call line segments, right? Finite pieces of lines. And um, moreover, that those particular ideas of line in our mind are infinitely divisible is obviously not true because there's a smallest part that you could see or imagine. So if you took this line and divided it over and over again into smaller pieces, they would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally they would be the smallest thing you can see, and then there would be no way to divide them into pieces that you could see anymore. Now, I mean, of course, if you believe that these ideas just represent something outside the mind, then you can say, and this is what Locke says, that true, you, when you can get down to an, a visible idea so small, this is called the minimum visible, 
can get down to an, a visible idea so small that you can't, you couldn't see something that was half as big as it. And so it's indivisible. But Locke says, nevertheless, it stands for something in the external body that is divisible. And you can know that for sure. But Barclay says, there is no such thing. <laughs> right? So in other words, like it, there's what Locke would say, and what I think we would, all of us would usually say, is that when you get the minimum visible, here's the minimum visible, um, and um, you can't divide it into pieces that you can see. That just means that it's the idea of something that that you can barely see, and that when you divide this thing, you'll divide it into microscopic pieces that you can't see. But again, Barclay says there is no such thing. This is the line. It's not a representation of the line. It is the line. So if it has smallest pieces, a line has smallest pieces. Okay, well, what about this proof then? So he says, um, and you have to think back to the way he explained this already in the introduction. How do we use these particular lines in doing a geometrical proof like this? So, you know, I just said that the side BS and the side BD this square is supposed to represent all squares. Now, again, according to Locke, the way that works is that, you know, this symbol I drew on the board is just the sign of an abstract idea of a square. And the abstract idea of the square agrees not only with this square that I drew on the board, in fact, it doesn't exactly agree with this square I drew on the board, right? This square on the board is a symbol of it, even though it's not really a square. <laughs> the lines aren't, the sides aren't straight, they're, you know, uh, whatever. Um, but in any case, forget about that part. So, you know, it agrees not only with this square I, I drew on the board, but with every square, every possible square. But so, but again, Barclay says there is no such thing. So how can we do this proof for all squares then? And Barclay says, well, we do this proof for all squares, not by using this particular square as a symbol of the abstract idea of square in my mind, but is using this particular square as a sign of all other particular ideas of squares that we can have. And that way of using something as sign is what Oh, someone says, isn't this like Zeno's paradox? Uh, well, um, it's certainly related somehow to Zeno's paradox. But, I mean, I guess, you know, that's probably another of, of the type of uncouth paradoxes that Barclay has in mind that he says he's going to get rid of. Right? According to Barclay, Zeno's paradox can't come up. Because, I mean, well, the, Zeno has different paradoxes. But let's say like the tortoise and Achilles paradox, where Achilles can never catch up with the tortoise because first he has to cover half the, length, the distance between them. And then in order to do that, he has to cover, you know, a quarter in order to do that. You know, so, like, he'll never get there. And, um, um, but according to Barclay, that... Cutting the distance into half only goes so far, and then you just have indivisible parts, and Achilles just has to move through each of those parts and it'll catch up with the tortoise. Um, so that's how it's related to Zeno's paradox. And in other words, Zeno's paradox is, in not, is one of the paradoxes that Barclay thinks he can get rid of. Um, but sorry, so getting back to this, right? So this way of something standing for something else is what I call, you know, called using it as a syntactic sign. Right? It's just saying that the different ideas, and you could call them different ideas of squares, but they actually, they are squares, right? The different squares are all interchangeable. The real and imaginary squares all 
according to the rule that I've established, can be interchanged with each other in certain ways. So that if I say something about this one, and I formulated it correctly, and I deduced it correctly, then um, I'm allowed to switch out this one and put in this one and say the same thing. So that's what it amounts to that I'm using, even though there's no such thing as a general idea, there is such thing as a general symbol or general name. And, um, or that is, this idea can be general, not in the sense that it's abstract, but in the sense that it stands for other ideas. And then Barclay says, so, um, the infinite divisibility of this line that we think it has, even though it's absurd. What makes us think it, it, it has infinitely many parts? He says, well, you know, it really only has a certain number of parts. But it's interchangeable with a line that has more parts according to these rules, as we're using it in the demonstration. So when we use it, and he doesn't say it exactly this way, but I think this is right. Like when we use it in a demonstration, we can't mention anything that depends on the exact number of smallest parts this line has, because that would disrupt the use of it to symbolize all the other lines. Now, there, I mean, there's something weird about this because If a line, if a visible line is 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 the is is the idea, then they never get that big, <laughs> right? I mean, that is, you could see the entire radius of the Earth as one of Barclay's examples, but only if you got far away, away enough from the Earth that the entire radius of the Earth, and we would normally say it looks really small, right? But according to Barclay, it, from it is really small for you when you're there. Because again, there's no difference between the idea of the earth in your mind and the earth itself. That is the earth. So if it looks small, it is small. <laughs> so you never get to see a line that's really big or imagine a line that's really big. And I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, I think Barclay can explain it, but it's going to be much more complicated. It has to do with lines that things that we treat as as lines, even though that it's really a matter of a lot of lines that we see one after another or something like that, not one big line that we see all at once. So anyway, be that as it may, you know, uh, forget that complication and just say, this line has to sign, stand for any other line, no matter how big. So as we do the proof, we can't mention how many parts it has. And therefore, if, you, um, if you're involved in these mistakes of abstract ideas and things outside the mind, it's easy for you to start thinking that... Um, um, We don't mention that in the proof because the line that we're actually working with doesn't have that limitation. Right? So the reason we don't, in order to do the proof, we, we don't stop and count up how many smallest pieces this has and how many smallest pieces this has. And then we would know for this particular square, we wouldn't have to write down some relation like this. We would know the side has, you know, 120 pieces and the diagonal has what it, right? We would, look, that would be the answer. So the reason we don't do that um, is because we're trying to say things about this square that we can interchange other squares in. And some of those squares are bigger and some of them are smaller. So that's the real reason, according to Barclay. And 
um, according to Barclay, what the proof actually establishes is something like, at least, I, and I think you have to add this, based on the regularities we've seen so far. Based on the regularities we've seen so far, the bigger the lines are, the closer this will get to being true. But it will never be exactly true. That's what the proof establishes. And the problem is the mathematicians misunderstanding why they don't mention. They, rather than thinking they must not mention the number of parts this line has because it will disturb the universality of the proof, they think they need not mention how many parts this line has because um, it doesn't have parts. That is, it doesn't have smallest parts. It doesn't have indivisible parts. And then when you say, well, but look, there's parts of it that are too, you know, there are parts of it that are smallest you can see, they'll say, oh, no, that's just a symbol of the abstract idea I have in my mind, and it stands for something that's never in my mind, but only outside my mind, a continuum with, of in, that's infinitely divisible. Um... All right, there's more to say about that, but I haven't said anything about Barfleek's refutation of skepticism, and there's only four minutes left. Um, so, um, Barclay gives a little history of skepticism in sections 86 through 88 of part one. And um, the history is something like this, that uh, people uh, had this belief, so I'm going to erase all of this. People had this belief in ideas versus external things. But then they noticed that we could have the ideas even if there were no external things. So they said, oh, hey, we're certain there are ideas. But how do we know there are external things? And that's how they started to doubt the existence of things. So, um, and the refutation of skepticism, of course, is very simple, which is that ideas are things. And so, since we're sure there are ideas, we're sure there are things. <laughs> End of refutation, right? Um, so, like, first of all, uh, this is what Barclay gives the history of skepticism is not the procedure that Descartes follows in the first meditation, for example, nor is it the procedure that the ancient skeptics follow. Um, so how do they actually operate? Well, like... Um, how can you cast doubt on everything that you've believed up until now? It would seem like you would need some external principle that you're certain of, and you would use it to criticize everything that you've believed up till now, and then that would be dogmatic, not skeptical. So therefore, skeptics always actually work by showing that our beliefs, our existing beliefs contradict each other. So we can't believe all of them anymore. Therefore, they're all in doubt now, basically. And so an example of doubt about the senses, now this is actually, I think he mentions this in the sixth meditation, but it's, and I think I've mentioned it before in this class too, that um, there's a tower that looks square when you're close up. When you're far away, it looks round.
so you say, you know, well, there's one thing I'm certain of. I can believe my senses about what shape things are. And then I say, well, wait. You believed the tower was round based on your senses, and then you believed it was square based on your senses. It can't be both square and round. Therefore, sometimes your senses deceive you. That's like one of the first steps in the first meditation. I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Um, let me just say one thing about it. So how does Barclay deal with that? And the way Barclay deals with that is he says, of course, strictly speaking, this round tower and this square tower are not the same thing. They can't be. They're two different ideas, and I, things are ideas. I had this idea first, and then later I had this idea. They don't contradict each other. How can two different things contradict each other? But wait, what did I mean then when I said the same tower looked round from far away that looked square close up? And Barclay says, you meant that according to the regularities you've observed in the world, um, you, you know, um, you expect a certain relationship between ideas you have here and ideas you have here. And in this case, that relationship was violated. They're two different ideas, but you've come to expect that this one will follow this one as you move closer to the. T Sorry, the, the a big round one will cut will follow the big round one as you move closer to the tower, and instead you got this one. So I mean, of course, in this case, there's an exam. There's a reason why the rule was violated in terms of broader rules. But ultimately, like, why should we expect any of our rules to be? followed. And if they weren't, then although there would be these individual tower ideas, what we call towers wouldn't exist. Right? So in other words, if every time you saw something that looked like this from far away, when you got up, it looked like this. Closer, it looked like that. There would be no such thing as towers. So if you ask Barclay, Okay, so wait, so why should we believe that this won't happen in every case? In which case there would be no things. So this is a different way of casting doubt on the existence of things. And I'm claiming it's closer to the one that Descartes starts with. And Bar Barclay's answer is, God is not a deceiver, right? We know that God is wise and good and establishes regularities. It's the same as Descartes' answer. He really has not refuted skepticism in a different way than Descartes has. Um, okay, and I'll end on that note. <laughs> See you uh, next week.